thank you for those of you who have come out today to hear my talk. Um, I have been working on this project now for a couple of years. Uh, my project title is Prolonged EEG After a First Unprovoked Seizure in an Adult. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but I do have a, a bunch of background to go through um, just to talk about uh, the studies that have been done in this area in the past, which are fairly vast. Um, we all know that uh, a single seizure or otherwise known as a first seizure is a far more common occurrence in the population than a diagnosis of epilepsy. And most of the numbers that you will read are roughly about one to 5% of the population may have a single event of a seizure or a first seizure, and about one to 2% may subsequently have recurrent seizures or what we know as epilepsy. That translates into about 150,000 adults per year in the US. And if you think of the Canadian population being roughly a 10th of that, we would have something in the neighborhood of 15,000 per year in Canada. So it's a quite a, it's quite a big number. We also know from studies that roughly half of those patients will recur and so subsequently have another seizure and be diagnosed with epilepsy and that most of those recurrences happen front up. So usually within the first six months and or at least the first two years after the incident event. For anybody who is involved with first seizure or runs a first seizure clinic and there are many around, I, I have one of them but I know a lot of centers have them you know that a diagnosis of a first seizure can create a lot of anxiety, and not just in the patients, but also in the caregivers, because often the patient doesn't even remember the event, and they just remember waking up in the hospital and not knowing what happened. Uh, but the caregiver is quite um, alarmed and anxious about the event and what to do if another one should happen. And there's often a lot of counseling that goes along with the diagnosis itself. In addition, driving, especially in the adult population, is a very big issue because often it means that the person has their driver's license revoked uh, and that can have consequences for their employment. Very rarely, I do have patients who have their first seizure at work and that obviously causes a lot of problems. People often have to come off work and I often get you know, employers asking me, well, when is it safe for the patient to go back? And it's a very difficult question to answer because we don't really know if and when they might recur. So all of this together um, can result in things like depression. It can be an anxious time for people. Um, and it's certainly an important um, thing for us to identify as best we can those people that are going to recur and go on and have epilepsy so that we can treat them appropriately and treat them early so that we, um, we get those patients organized um, uh, and you'll see later that actually early treatment can reduce the recurrence risk, at least uh, in the first two years. So we also know that the definition of epilepsy has been changing over time and that it used to require at least two unprovoked clinical events to make the diagnosis. But the ILEE has changed that such that you only really need one clinical event and something which makes you high risk. So they, they arbitrarily define that as at least a 60% risk within 10 years. And you'll see that if you do have an epileptiform EEG after a first seizure, you probably would be in that category of risk. And therefore, you would be diagnosed with epilepsy. So you may just need a single seizure and an abnormal EEG to get that diagnosis. And again, it's really important to identify those people that are going to have epilepsy and require treatment so that we can get them treated early. So I will spend a, a little bit of time today talking about um, two major AAN guidelines that came out about first seizure because they really are quite um, expansive in all of the studies that they go over uh, in terms of the, the um, prior um, studies that have been done in this area. Uh, but specifically, um, I wanted to discuss this particular trial on its own because when you go over the AAN guidelines, they talk about a class one study um, which is a randomized control tri trial, and it is this study that they're referring to. So it's a trial by the first seizure trial group. It was a study that came out in neurology in 1993, and they had an update in neurology in 1997. And this is one of the only uh, multicenter randomized controlled trials that was done in first seizure patients. And what they did was they randomized patients to either immediate treatment with an anti-seizure medication after a first event, or delayed treatment until the patient had a, had a second unprovoked event. Um, and you can see the list of medications. It's an older study and they're older medications. Um, not that that necessarily makes any difference. And when you look at the recurrence rates, so you can see them there, there is a reduced recurrence risk with immediate treatment versus delayed tre treatment. So in the immediate treatment group, about 24% of the patients recurred and 42% in the, the delayed treatment group. 
However, when you look at um, how long patients remained seizure-free for, so if you look at the rates for seizure freedom at one year that persisted or seizure freedom at two years that was prolonged seizure freedom, there are really no differences between the groups. And so the ultimate conclusion of that study is that immediate treatment with an anti-epileptic drug does reduce the risk of relapse, but it does not change the probability of long-term remission, and also in that sense does not really change um, the diagnosis of epilepsy per se. So um, I'm just going to switch now to the, the first AAN guideline, which came out in 2007, uh, and they did an evaluation of first seizure in adult patients. So there was a similar guideline that came out prior to this in, in pediatric patients, but I'm not going to discuss that because my study really involves adult patients, and so um, I haven't addressed it today. This, this guideline also addresses a number of things outside of EEG. So they look at imaging, CT scans primarily, but also at blood work. So they looked at toxicology screening. Um, they looked at metabolic screening, things like that. But the, really the only one of importance to me is EEG, and that's what I'm going to discuss. So they pose the question in the guidelines, should an EEG be routinely ordered in an adult presenting with an apparent unprovoked first seizure? Um, and again, they looked at one class one study, so we've already discussed that study. That's the study by the first seizure trialist group, and 10 class two studies. And there were a high degree of abnormalities on EEGs across studies. So they said anywhere between 12 and 73% of EEGs are abnormal, with an average yield of about 51%. But that's for any abnormality, including nonspecific changes like slowing. So when you look specifically at just epileptiform discharge, the number is lower. Um, so somewhere between 8 and 50% of EEGs show epileptiform discharge with an average of 29%. But those are really the significant abnormalities because when you look at patients that have recurrence, it is the epileptiform discharge that really uh, incurs that increased risk of recurrence for seizure. So if you had an epileptiform discharge on your EEG, your chance or risk for recurrence is about 50%, whereas with a normal EEG, it's only about 27%. And when they looked at things like slowing or more nonspecific changes on the EEG, it did not purport an increased risk for seizure recurrence. Um, in terms of the EEG itself, there may be a number of factors um, that make a difference in terms of what you end up getting in terms of abnormalities. Will you see an abnormality and will you see an interictal epileptiform discharge? So that may include the timing of the EEG from the incident event. Um, even the time to entry in the clinical trial may make a difference. Obviously, if we're looking at recurrence rates and you enter the trial early, you're much more likely to see your recurrence than if you enter the trial very late. Um, the duration of the recording, which is what is very significant, obviously, to my study, as well as treatment, and treatment with anti-epileptic medications. So there are only a few trials that look specifically at timing, um, and most of those ones were done fairly efficiently, so within roughly two weeks of the incident event, and only one study that really looked at anti-epileptic drug treatment. Um, and although patients were treated with anti-epileptic drugs, it didn't seem to change whether or not the EEG was predictive of recurrence. So you would think that, if anything, treatment would make it less likely for you to recur, but it didn't seem to make a difference in terms of the predictive value of the EEG. So ultimately, with the 2007 guideline, they came up with uh, the primary recommendation that an EEG or a routine EEG should be part of the neurodiagnostic evaluation of a patient with a first apparent unprovoked seizure. Number one, because it has substantial yield, but number two, because it has value in determining the risk for seizure recurrence. So in 2015, they updated the guideline, and they were looking primarily at management of first seizure as opposed to evaluation. And they posed three essential questions. So one was, what are the risks for seizure recurrence after a first seizure? Number two, um, does immediate treatment with a seizure drug uh, reduce or change short-term risks for seizure recurrence or long-term prognosis for seizure freedom or remission? And number three, for those patients who are prescribed um, drugs immediately, what are the risks of adverse events? And so I'll address all of those briefly. Um, they essentially found four factors that substantially increase your risk for seizure recurrence. Um, on that list is a primary, uh, sorry, a prior brain insult, um, an EEG with epileptiform discharge on it, um, which is obviously important for me, abnormal brain imaging or a nocturnal seizure. So the first two of those are level A evidence. And if you look at the numbers there, um, there are different ways that they calculated the statistics. So some are hazard ratios, some are odds ratios, but overall there's about a two to two and a half um, 
times risk of having a recurrence with any one of those particular um, abnormalities. So uh, epileptiform EEG is about a two, about just over a two times risk. So they did conclude that um, immediate treatment did reduce your re recurrence risk over the first two years by about 35%. Um, there was some mention of quality of life, but there wasn't there wasn't a lot of data on it, so they just said it might not affect quality of life. They also concluded that um, it doesn't increase your the incidence of sustained seizure remission, which is, is the same data that we saw from the first seizure trialist group, and that is the strongest data that's entered um, into these AAN guidelines. Um, and only one study looked at mortality, though that study didn't seem to find any difference in mortality when patients were treated. So overall, when they looked at adverse events with treatment, um, they were broad, there were many listed, but most of the adverse events were considered mild and reversible, and they occurred in about 70 to 31% of the patients that were treated. So it is important because we don't want to treat patients with something that might potentially have side effects, um, especially if we're not entirely convinced that they are one of those patients that has an increased risk for occurrence. So we know from prior studies, and Selinsky is a, is a well-known study where they looked at serial EEGs and they found that with a first EEG, about half of the patients might have an abnormality of an epileptiform discharge, but it takes up to roughly four routine EEGs before you get 92% of the patients having an abnormality. And some patients will never show that abnormality even though we know they have epilepsy, so they never show it interictally. Um, so uh, the idea is that, well, uh, in a first seizure patient, you're unlikely to get routine multiple EEGs. Um, we generally just get one EEG, so you get about that 50% chance of finding something or not finding it. And again, there are several factors that may determine whether or not you find it. So timing of the EEG, sleep, length of the study, and even the expertise of the reader may become important. There are a couple of trials that have recently looked at um, length of EEG and whether or not it makes a difference. All of these trials are looking at patients um, who have are really all comers um, to either, some of them are for EMU, some of them are for just routine outpatient EEG. This is the most recent study. It comes from the Mayo Clinic and it is looking at outpatient um, population within their, um, their lab. It really only looks at hour long studies versus half an hour length uh, and tries to make a determination about whether or not you see more abnormality within the first hour, or sorry, first half an hour, which is our standard length of an EEG or even 20 minutes um, versus the last half an hour. And so out of all their patients, they found that about a quarter, roughly 24% or 23.6% had epileptiform discharge on the EEG. And out of those 426, 81 of them had discharges only after the first half an hour. So overall, in terms of the patient, patient population, it's not a big increase. It's only about 4.5%. But when you look at the percentage in terms of abnormal, uh, abnormality or the number of abnormal EEGs, it's actually a yield that has increased by 19%. So um, they found that to be significant. Um, they did comment that the pretest probability uh, makes a difference. So if you really suspect that somebody has seizures, you're far more likely to um, see an epileptiform discharge on the EEG, 43.9% uh, versus 6.6%. So if you order the study for something nonspecific, you're likely to get a nonspecific result. Um, and also sleep does seem to make a difference. So those patients that slept only after the first half an hour were much more likely to have abnormalities in the second half an hour of their study. There have been trials that have looked at longer studies, so longer than an hour. This is one that looked at um, 172 EGs that ranged in length between 60 minutes and about six hours. Um, the average time was about three hours. Uh, again, the, the rates of enterectal discharge is roughly similar to the previous study, about 26%. They found that those discharges were seen in the first 20 minutes in 53% of the, the patients and only after the first 20 minutes in 47% of the patients. Um, so the mean time to the first um, interictal epileptiform discharge was about half an hour, or roughly the length of, an, of a standard EEG, um, although the median time was skewed. So they did find that the median time was it was 10 minutes and there was a right skew to the data. Also there was a longer time if you were looking for a temporal epileptiform discharge versus a generalized discharge. So the rationale for my trial after all of that is to really look at longer uh, phase EEGs and to, discuss, to, to decide whether or 
not there is any increased yield in terms of finding interictal epileptiform discharges in a, in a longer study um, and to, to, to figure out whether this is a potentially more efficient way to diagnose new onset epilepsy. Um, and it is important because as we've seen from the AN guidelines and their conclusions, um, if we do treat people earlier, they do seem to have a 35% reduced recurrence risk, at least within the first two years of having their first seizure. So that has impacts on the patient in terms of their ability to, to drive. If we can keep them on the road, they're much more likely to stay employed. Um, and things like depression and other factors may be affected as well. So um, we're hoping that it may help to diagnose patients quicker, easier, and earlier. So my study basically uh, included all patients that were over 16 years of age who had had a first unprovoked seizure. So I did in fact include patients who may have had a, a symptomatic seizure, um, an acute symptomatic seizure, because I'm primarily looking at EEG as opposed to recurrence risk overall. Um, but there aren't many patients of, in, in all of this data that, that have acute symptomatic seizures. There's at least one. And the diagnosis of the seizure itself had to be made by an epileptologist, so we didn't accept all referrals. Even if a neurologist felt that the patient had a seizure, they had to be cleared by an epileptologist before they were entered in the study. So like, I don't have this data printed out later, but um, like most first seizure um, clinics and also most of the trials that have already been done, the vast majority of patients that are entered into these have either primary generalized or secondary generalized seizure as the first presentation. And the reason for that is it's a dramatic event that is easily recognizable and the patients get seen easily and quickly. And the patients themselves or their caregivers recognize those very clearly as seizures, where sometimes with you know, a focal discognitive seizure, it's not necessarily on the first seizure that the patients know that that's what it is. And so it isn't until later, sometimes after they've had several events that they end up seeking medical advice. So for my patients, they all got a six hour video EEG. Um, we then took that data and we compared the first 30 minutes of their six hours to the remainder of the study to determine whether or not the extended EEG made any difference to see whether or not any new cases of epilepsy were diagnosed and also to look at the, the rates of known recurrence within the study patient. So thus far, I have 31 patients enrolled in the study. I'm only including 28 today in the analysis that I'm going to discuss because three of them are fairly new and I haven't had time to um, look at their data in detail. So of the 28 patients, 15 are male and 13 are female. Um, the overall age range of the patients is between 17 and 81 with a mean age at the EEG of 39 years old. And most of the EEGs are actually normal. So 19 out of the 28 six-hour studies are normal, which is 68% of the studies. Almost all of the patients did have sleep during the EEG. And I do have listed somewhere whether or not they slept within the first half an hour or not. Um, but it doesn't seem to be entirely significant because of, of the five patients that didn't sleep during the EEG, they all had normal studies and all of the other patients did have sleep. But I do have that data there somewhere. Um, and I have it organized, uh, but not in this talk. So of the EEGs, nine of them were considered to be abnormal, five with epileptiform abnormalities, one with only sharply contoured waves, and three that had focal slowing. Of the five epileptiform abnormalities, three had generalized, sorry, only a, a single patient had generalized epileptiform discharge. So that patient had polyspike wave, three hertz spike wave, as well as generalized spike wave activity. There was one patient who had right temporal sharp waves and spikes in sleep, one patient who had fairly diffuse epileptiform discharge, so it was seen in the left frontal temporal and central region, the right posterior quadrant, as well as bilaterally synchronous discharges, primarily frontal. There was a one patient that had um, discharges in the right temporal as well as the left temporal, um, and one with left temporal sharp and spike waves in sleep. Um, of the three focal, one was very minor, so just some intermittent temporal slowing, which we often see on routine studies, fairly nonspecific. One with central parietal slowing and one with frontotemporal delta that was fairly rhythmic, left greater than right. So in terms of whether or not the six hours seemed to make any difference in the findings of the EEGs overall, there were two patients in whom epileptiform activity was only seen um, after the first 30 minutes. However, in, in so far, those two patients actually had their abnormalities during sleep. So one was the patient with the right focal temporal sharpened spike wave, and the other was with the left temporal sharpened spike waves. 
um, there was a single patient where it seemed that the six hours did make a difference in terms of the overall interpretation of the EEG, but that patient just had slowing. And so it really didn't make uh, a lot of difference in terms of the patient's diagnosis ultimately. And there were two patients in whom um, they both had fairly um, abundant EEG uh, abnormalities. Um, and so the six hours does make a difference in terms of overall interpretation. So for example, I think one of the patients had more right-sided discharges in the six hours than they did in the first half an hour. But in terms of actually diagnosing epilepsy, um, they did have an epileptiform discharge in the first half an hour. And, that did, and, and although they had it also in the six hours and we got more information, it ultimately didn't change their diagnosis. Um, obviously, within a six-hour recording, there's a lot of artifact, and so that's something that comes into play. You know, people can't sit still for six hours, so they tend to move around more. Obviously, they eat during that time, um, and there is, uh, there is sometimes leads that come off and, and more artifact than you would see within the, the standard recording. So in addition to EEG, we look, we've looked at a number of other things. Um, imaging is one of them, so all of the patients have had imaging studies of one kind or another. The vast majority of them are MRI, although there are a few patients who couldn't get an MRI because uh, they had a pacemaker and could only get a CT scan. So of the 25 patients that got an MRI, 15 of them were normal. Um, of the abnormal studies, there were five with the typical nonspecific T2 hyperintensities that we often see. Uh, there was one patient that had a subtle um, subtly asymmetric hippocampus, left greater than right. There was one with multiple areas of blooming artifact that was consistent with microhemorrhages. There was one patient that was found to have a four millimeter pineal cyst, one with CSF extension into the cella, and one with multiple areas of focal, focal heterotopic gray matter in the lateral ventricles, right greater than left, as well as cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. So what's interesting about that last patient um, is that the EG, in fact, was normal, uh, but that that patient did get treated uh, with an anti-seizure medication based on the MRI finding, and it was the only one in which the MRI seemed to be um, the most significant, in fact, diagnostic. So there were a few other imaging modalities that were used. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, but a colleague did order a baseline SPECT in one of the studies that was found to be normal, uh, and there was one CT um, where it showed a resolving uh, right temporal interparenchymal hemorrhage with right frontal parietal subdural hygroma, and that probably is the acute symptomatic patient that I was talking about before. So there are several patients that were treated with anti-seizure medications. Um, not all of these are, are patients of mine, and I don't always have good notes about um, why or how long they stayed on medication, but at least um, the, the ones that you see listed there um, were started on medication. Um, there was at least one of the patients that was started on lamotrigine was based on MRI findings. Um, and I'm sure that there are many of these patients that have come off medication subsequently, but I don't have that update just yet. Uh, one of the patients was involved after the first seizure, had recurrent seizures, and was involved in a trial for VIMPAT. Um, I do know that the, it's a long, um, the study was long ago, so I do know that the patient was on the study drug during that trial. So in terms of seizure recurrence, um, six of the patients did have clear-cut recurrence. Um, one patient had an unwitnessed event, and it wasn't clear whether it was a seizure or not based on the notes from the uh, treating physician. Uh, one patient went on to have events of flushing that were considered seizures um, and were treated that way, and three patients were lost to follow up. So of the six patients that had recurrent seizures, um, it did not seem that the six-hour EEG made a particular difference for them. So in four of them, they had normal prolonged EEGs. One of the patients had generalized epileptiform discharge in the EEG, but again, that patient had it within the first 30 minutes, as well as in the prolonged study. So it wasn't clear that the six hours really made a difference in that patient. Um, and there was one patient that had a very abnormal EEG um, and again, this was a patient where within the six hours, we may have seen a different pattern of um, discharge, but in fact had discharge that was epileptiform and clearly epileptiform both in the first half an hour and in the later study. Um, so of the patients with the recurrence, none of them really fell into the category where the epileptiform discharge was seen later in the EEG after the first 30 minutes. However, one of those patients, so there, if you can if we go back a few slides, you'll remember there were two patients in whom they only had epileptiform discharge after the first 30 minutes. One of those patients was the patient, in fact, who had the unwitnessed event, and it wasn't clear if it was a seizure. So it's certainly possible that that person recurred. So 
with that, I just, um, that, that's most of the data that I have thus far. Um, I do have, I'm still ongoing and, and recruiting patients, and so I will have more data, and, and certainly it will be more detailed at a later date. Um, but I just thought we would stop and reflect on what, what we've sort of learned so far from the data that I have. Uh, most of the prolonged EEGs are in fact normal, um, so about 68% of them. So when you think back to the number of patients um, in previous studies that have looked at long EEGs, they had an, an abnormality rate of interictal epileptiform discharge of roughly a quarter, so somewhere between 24 and 26% of the patients. Whereas if you look at my numbers, I had five with epileptiform discharge of the 28, it's about 17%. And I think the reason for that is primarily just that I'm looking at a different population of patients. So in first seizure patients, I think it's just, it's just different than it would be in a patient with a diagnosis of, of epilepsy or known seizure disorder. So only two of the study thus far have shown epileptiform discharge that was only present in the remainder of the study and not in the first half an hour. Um, it seems that other factors may be at play. So of course, the timing to, from the incident event is extremely important. And practically what happens in the hospital is that it's hard to get these studies done in an efficient way. So although I'm able to enroll patients, they don't get enrolled that quickly and they probably could get a routine study quicker than they're gonna be able to get a six hour study at least at this time. Um, sleep seems to be a very important factor. So of the two patients that we found um, that do have abnormalities after the first 30 minutes, they both had them in sleep. Um, although that is something that is easier to get on a six hour study. So uh, of course we can order a sleep deprived one hour EEG, uh, but it seems that most of the patients in a six hour time period will have some sleep on their study. And so it's, it, you, you don't even almost have to order it as, as a sleep deprived because most of them nap anyway. Um, so there may be a combination of factors that go into why we do or do not see um, the epileptiform discharge on their EEGs. Um, and again, longer studies contain more artifact, but in addition to that, there is a little bit of um, reader fatigue. So one of the disadvantages of a longer study is that as an EEG, we all know it's easy to go page by page when you're looking at half an hour or even an hour, but six hours is a bit more cumbersome. And so it may be easier to, to miss a single discharge in that time. Um, obviously, if there's abundant discharge, it wouldn't be missed, but it, it's a little bit harder if you're looking for a needle in, that, in the longer haystack. So um, the yield of longer studies, um, it seems at this point anyway, maybe slightly less um, in first seizure patients compared to the standard population of patients with epilepsy. Um, there was another study that looked at EMU recordings and time to first interictal discharge that found that 36% uh, of the patients had their first discharge in 20 minutes and 89% within the first 24 hours. So you know, when I'm just looking at the time frame of six hours, why did I choose six hours versus 24 hours versus eight hours versus any other time? It's really a practical decision because as an outpatient study, most hospitals run on a roughly eight hour workday, and that is the most convenient time to get somebody in and out on an outpatient basis. Um, so when I looked at this study that I've quoted here, and I don't have the table to show you, uh, but they do list out like there are 49 patients, all of whom had abnormal epileptiform discharge. The vast majority of them, I, say, I would say, did happen within the first six hours in that EMU study. So there were about five out of 49 that happened after that time frame. So I think six hours is a reasonable amount of time. Um, it's possible that longer studies may be more important. It's possible that sleep is the most important factor. And, it is, and as long as we get sleep on the EEG, that's more important than the length. So a lot of these things are still to be figured out, um, but that's essentially the data that I have thus far, uh, and I'll just open that up, up to any questions that anybody has. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, let me ask the first question. Uh, simply, you had some time to look at this. Do you think that the six hour um, EEG is cost effective? Is this something that you would recommend to be widely used? So in the, um, the Mayo study where they looked at studies that went up to an hour in length, um, they, they said that there was an increased yield of 19%. But when you look at the percentage overall of the patients, it's only about 4.5%. If you look at my numbers, percentage-wise, it's actually higher than that. So it's about 7% of the 
um, of the studies that are abnormal actually have um, increased yield in the six hours. So it's hard to say, uh, you know, based on a smaller study, whether or not it really is necessary. Um, there's no question that there are going to be some patients in whom it does take either multiple routine studies or a longer study to find the abnormality. Um, but I think, that, not that I've done this cost analysis, but if you do routine studies more than once, it is it's more expensive than doing just one prolonged study. Um, and so it, it may be reasonable, but I think we still have to wait and see what the actual yield is. Okay, thank you. Do you find that patients are willing to do the six hour uh, EEG or do you find reluctance? It's varied. Um, work makes a big difference because they have to come in on a work, a work day between nine and five. And patients who are reluctant to take any more time off work um, won't come in and do it. <laughs> So, you know, I, I have a varied response. I have a lot of patients who are happy to do it and, and willing, and some who just clearly say, no, I, I'm not interested or I'm, I can't take the time off. Okay, uh, it's interesting that the treatment of drugs after the first seizure is going to delay recurrence, but, but the seizures still tend to recur in the, uh, up to two years. Uh, do you have any insight into to why that would be? Um, if, if the person's drug responsive and you put them on drugs, you, you'd expect the seizures wouldn't recur. Um, are you dealing typically with complex partial or just uh, discognitive seizures here, which are, are drug resistant? So the vast majority of the patients in this study and also in the adult population are going to have focal seizures. Um, and part of that is that the most common disorder that we see on the adult side in terms of generalized seizures is JME, which is usually an easy diagnosis in the clinic because the patient has had myoclonus often prior to having a generalized seizure and they don't necessarily need the workup before we decide they have epilepsy. We often know clinically that's what they have. Um, so most of my patients would be focal and most of the patients in the study are focal. Okay, uh, so what you're typically seeing in, in the um, studies you do, would it be spiking over the temporal lobes? Is that a common thing? Uh, or slowly in some, I guess, what's your typical abnormality? You put it up, but I didn't entirely take it. Sure, I'll just bring it up again so you can take a look at it. Thank um, you. So this is the list of all the abnormalities on the EGs. Okay. You can see the list of the epileptiform discharges. So there are four that were fairly focal, some with multifocal, like that third one there, um, one that looked bilateral temporal, and two that looked temporal but unilateral, and just one that was generalized. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess maybe a, a final question uh, from me. Uh, do you, uh, well, we're still a little puzzled by this, uh, this ILA suggestion that we treat a single seizure if there's a probability of recurrence. Is that what you would do these days? In other words, uh, when, when would you treat the single seizure? When would you wait to see if there's going to be another one? So I think that's why the, the second guideline um, looked at the, uh, the adverse events with treatment because they wanted to weigh the risks and benefits of treatment. So if there are severe risks for treatment that you really don't want to treat people unless it's absolutely necessary. I would say that I do treat patients who have had a single seizure and have an epileptiform discharge on their EEG because they do fit by the ILE criteria, a diagnosis of epilepsy, and they're likely to recur. Now, sometimes that's a very personal decision on the part of the patient, and you can try to give them rough statistics of recurrence risk and have them decide on their own whether or not they want treatment. I would say for a lot of patients, especially uh, in an area like Hamilton where we don't have great public transport, 
their biggest issue is that they want to be able to drive. And they'll say, well, if the, I have another seizure and I'm not allowed to drive, then I'll take the medication. It's often a choice that people make. Not always, but it, it can be a big consideration. So going back to your question about treatment, um, we know that treatment really is not, um, it's not, uh, it's just that. It's not a solution for most patients. It's a treatment. And so even on medication, unfortunately, people recur. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a standard part of treatment for this disorder. So it's true, we don't really make uh, a whole lot of impact with early treatment but we do reduce their uh, risk at least front up. And for some patients, I think that makes a big difference, but probably not for everybody. So there may be those patients that wait and say, I'm just gonna wait until I have another event and then get treated. And there's the odd patient, to be honest with you, that even though you're quite convinced they had a seizure, they are not convinced. And so they don't wanna be treated. And they often actually want confirmation. They don't, the patients are very uncomfortable with a clinical diagnosis. They want the test to tell them that it's that they have seizures. And I have to often explain to them that the vast majority of patients have normal testing and it's not gonna be necessarily give us the answer. So that's just a clinical thing that, that you notice when you get you know, patients with this. And maybe just before we sign off, I could ask you to talk about one thing that I know that you're passionate about. Uh, people losing their driver's licenses. Um, this is pretty much an economic disaster for a lot of people. Um, would you talk to that? Uh, we've got a fairly young crowd here today and I don't think people appreciate what it means to lose your license. So for a lot of people, unfortunately, it means that they can't get to work and it means that they often lose their employment. So there is a huge consequence to them. Um, and it's not just financial in terms of employment, but it's often extremely socially isolating as well. They become completely dependent on people around them to take them grocery shopping, to do everything for them. And, and it, it's a very uncomfortable situation and, and it's very frustrating. Um, and I end up spending a lot of time talking much more to patients about their driving than their seizures because it is their primary concern most often. Okay, I think we have run through the questions. Let me thank you for a really exemplary, clear, and cogent talk. Some applause. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.